Hello. How goes it? Rosa Scheib here. Uh, giving you my insights about what's going on with the whole China stuff. Uh, that's the best 360 I can give you. Don't have the same gear as uh, Kim Bozak. You know, RIP him. Really sucks what happened to him. Uh, a little bit of lessons. As soon as uh, all that went down, I started checking all my shit. Seriously. But um, under the subject at hand about China, I'm not going to go into the details about the f what is FUD and what's not FUD or the, the, the different shutdowns or the price or anything like that. I, I wanted to talk about the lack of empathy I've been seeing in the last two weeks when the initial story started breaking out that China may in fact, you know, some people had some insights that China and in China is would be either banning Bitcoin or shutting down these exchanges. And I'm seeing like a lot of people like, well, you know, we don't really need China. Uh, this is stupid. Uh, the Chinese government can't really ban Bitcoin. People will just go peer to peer. And you know what? All of that is true. You know, Bitcoin can still function without China. But what I wasn't seeing was, you know, about the people within China that are part of the Bitcoin community. I wasn't seeing much sympathy or empathy for them because they are stuck in a rock at a hard place, particularly these Bitcoin exchanges that are in there. Um, you know, China has a history of doing these crackdowns with their businesses, uh, just crackdowns in general. I'm not going to go through the whole history of that. Uh, you can always Google it. I'm just kind of stick into the recent um, crackdowns that have happened within the Chinese government and for many different purposes. You know, the biggest one was. Um, 2004 they did and they still do that it's called their anti-vice program if you will they have a whole department of people that are devoted to this where they started cracking down on pornography within their country this came right after they had um, secured the 2008 Olympic bid and within like a month of that announcement boom they started cracking down on pornography. Now, if you look into it, many activists said that this was an effort on China to go after uh, democratic voices, uh, opposition voices to the Chinese government, to prevent them from basically embarrassing China when 2008 rolled around and having protests. If you watch the Olympics of that particular year, go to the highlight reels or anything like that, or any of the news stories, you, you didn't see a protest in sight. No protesters, no banners, no activists. The crackdown was very effective. And there were other crackdowns of that nature that were very effective. But it was a crackdown on the internet. Like 398 people in the initial run-up were arrested. 700 websites. I know that doesn't sound a lot like a lot, considering there's like 1.5 billion people in China. Also the fact that just how wide the internet is, but the internet functions differently in China. The Great Wall of China the great firewall as they call it everything is censored there so it was significant for them and they've been having a series of other type of crackdowns the 2008 rolls around China's at a new high you know there's a global collapse occurring but China looks great but of course China you know because it is a global collapse started getting affected by it so there was another series of crackdowns. There was the anti-bribery crackdown where they cracked down against officials that were actually wrongfully, you know, receiving bribes for companies being able to conduct business in China, uh, primarily Chinese companies. But nonetheless, there was a crackdown. There was also a crackdown on short sellers because they were shorting these companies and showing the weakness and the manipulation that was occurring within uh, the Chinese business sector much like here in the states where we saw the weakness and manipulation happening during the i would i call it earlier like 2006 to 2009 the global collapse the mortgage collapse oh i guess i'm doing this right i'm almost getting hit by cars here um but you know here in the states and even in europe and, and those other countries the, the distinction and difference between China and here is 
in China, you face the death penalty. They have the death penalty for white collar crimes. And it's very controversial because one, it's not like a violent act. Uh, the Chinese people do support the death penalty, but it's not like you're a murderer, a rapist, a thief, uh, something like really bad or significant, a violent type of a crime, uh, something against the state, if you will. But you start seeing these white collar people going away. And majority of them did, you know, commit the acts of bribery. Uh, they were manipulating their companies. They're doing, you know, false trades, insider trades, had these like fluff companies, if you will. But then there was a series of them that were just bag holders. Because the thing in China is, a lot of these Chinese companies, many of them have, in order to consist and operate, have a relationship with the government. Whether it's they have a significant elite, and when I mean elite, like, the puppet masters, the one percent of the one percent invested in their companies, either they're working in their companies, like the offspring, if you will, uh, significant either significant shareholders, or at least have an investment or okay. And oftentimes, what ends up happening is like when a company becomes significantly big or profitable, they get that knock, they get that, that knock on the door. And it's the members of the Chinese party wanting to wet their beak, if you will. But the economy collapsed. Certain business schemes that were schemes started to show their faces, if you will. Other businesses, you know, they just were rocked by the economy. They were going to have low returns. They were going to have a rough time, if you will. That's, that's what happens when things slow down. And so... Instead of acknowledging it, if you will, acknowledging corruption or acknowledging uh, the break in the economy, if you will, the Chinese government decided to create a series of bag holders and saying that these, a lot of them, but not all of them, were responsible for the failure of the company because they were fraudsters and scammers. And this caused significant anxiety within the Chinese populace because this is not what they wanted the death penalty for, and they know that the party... The, the People's Party, Republic of China, pulled their money out of these companies before they started these charges. So they were able to get their returns and continue on and have their wealth, but everyone else, all the other shareholders, the regular people, got hold in the bag. And so somebody was blamed, typically a, a CEO. Look up the Bernie Madoff of China, how he was executed in 2013, and look how very wonky and weird that particular case is, an example of that. So there's reasons to fear, you know, that knock on the door because you don't know what that type of knock is. Even if you have good relations with the uh, People's uh, Republic of uh, Bank, the, the party, you're hobnobbing, you're doing all the business, maybe some of the party members have a bit of an asset or so you have uh, family members or people that they've tapped to work within your company, that you've allowed in your company and they work there. You might have all those good, good relations, but you never know because one of the biggest things that China doesn't like is having bad press, bad face, if you will, having a bad image, whether internally or externally. They Internally, they crack down very hard on it. They want everything to be good, 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 no matter what. And because of this tight damage control thing, they lock people up, they silence people, they punish people, they do anything to scrub the record, if you will, to make the image of China's economy, the image China, of China as a whole, a blessing and a good thing for the people and the world over. So, yeah, these Chinese exchanges, when they got that knock on the door, yeah, they're opening their books, they're complying, and yeah, they're going to shut down because that's what's going to happen. Now, they may reopen. There might be a sideways or backwards deal where members of the party or people that have been tapped to come in might have a bigger control or say or controlling interest in the company. That's most likely what's going to happen. Not that it was, wasn't already occurring, but it may not have been occurring. A lot of these businesses, particularly um, like WeChat or what's the other one? Albiaban, that got really big or huge didn't really start out with, you know, party support or party say or party members a part of it. Not initially. When it started gaining traction, you bet your ass they were there.
to make that money, to make that that profit, and also particularly with WeChat, to have that control over that app and the, and all the different little infrastructures that they have placed in there to have uh, control of the communication, almost the, the number one communication means of people within the China. So for the exchange part, it's understandable how very goddamn cooperative they are. Uh, this is something they've already known, this is something they probably already planned. They're trying to be very, 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 very compliant as possible, if you will, because the consequences are very significant. Now, as for the people that are traders, that are users of, the, of Bitcoin and other tokens within the uh, Chinese economy, it's understandable why, again, why there was a crackdown, particularly on Ethereum. Now, I know that people are saying because NEO is the Chinese Ethereum, and it may be so. I've already stated that myself. was my suspicion that NEO was the Chinese Ethereum. But at the same time, again, China has such a tight control over its businesses. It says, really, who gets a business, who doesn't get a business, just like here in the States, but thinking of it as a million-dollar investment thing. That um, Shout out to Thomas G. and the Pound Nation when he talks about it. He talks about how nobody had the money to get into Snap Inc. Nobody had the money to get into Facebook because you had to be a million-dollar accredited investor. You already had to have wealth to order to get in. It operates a very similar fashion in China. Mind you, still people are able to bootstrap. They're able to gather funds and, and, and be able to work within the region, city, province, things of that nature, and build up from there. And that happens quite often. Is it's still a billion, a billion and a half people. But if you want to be on the internet, if you want to export, import, which is what technically, if you think about it, Bitcoin and the capital is, is exporting, importing, across ones and zeros. If you want to do all that, you got to have that Chinese party approval and stamp. And these investors, these people trying to make a living, trying to build something for themselves, trying to do something with the ICOs, whether they're garbage, shit coins, or no matter what, but having the opportunity to invest in something that, which they've never had the opportunity to do so, they get at the ground level ground level with not that much income really if you think about it and make a profit so for them they're also a very precarious position because they can't have these altcoins they can't have ethereum or uh i don't know litecoin or things of that nature so they dumped they may even dump some of their bitcoin they may still held some to uh, to a point uh whatever they could pull off the exchanges they pulled off maybe they have it in hardware paper wallets stashed all over the place and hoping and praying that they don't get a knock on the door saying you have a unregistered currency that's also a fear for them so many many, many of them may have uh, dumped don't think quite enough of them may have dumped but some of them may have dumped just just on the fear factor alone because they don't know what's going on particularly on the alt end when they know they couldn't use their alts to participate in ICOs and how to get into NEO. As for everybody else, it's the noobs. We haven't educated noobs well enough to know to ride these crackdowns and waves, and particularly the wonkiness of China. Instead of uh, telling them buy, buy, buy and hold, we need to educate them that you're gonna hear a lot of stuff. There's going to be dips. There are gonna be massive dips. You might've bought at five, and it'll crash down to four or three. It's okay. Because your your Bitcoin will never be zero. It will always have value. It will go back up. It may not, not go up back up in a day, a week, or a month. I mean, if you think about it, what was it? Bitcoin was at what? A high of 118 when Mt. Gox failed. That was in 2013. It took almost two years to get back there. I think it might have broke to 3,000, I think, at one point maybe, or close to it, but never quite of achieving. Don't quote me on that. But that's something that has occurred over time, over years. I mean, there was a one point where you could have picked up Bitcoin for 200 bucks, 400 bucks. Those days are gone. But what it never did, what it never happened during these crashes to go back to zero. It never became zero. 
And so now that it's trading around, I think the last time I looked was like 380.50, you know, it'll get back to four. It'll be a slow climb to five. I think Adi, the, the uh, BS filter has called it. We're going to have like a, a little plateau for there for a while, which Bitcoin's been known to do. Uh, don't get me wrong, Insti institutional investors, uh, the establishment took full advantage of the situation. I'm sure China's taking full advantage of the situation. My whole point is the people caught in the middle, the people that are operating those exchanges, they're not sure or certain, you know, if their deals are still going to hold, if they're doing everything right, if they're going to be able to come back at all, if at all. Uh, other traders, smaller traders, your peer-to-peer -peer traders are probably checking their back a little bit more to make sure they're not going to get knocked on the door. Because, you know, we have chain analysis, embedding their information on those exchanges. You, you know, even though China's, those Chinese exchanges were known, notorious for not having the greatest uh, KYC AML, you still don't know. Email addresses, phone numbers two-factor application, IP addresses. There's there's information on those exchanges. And now with VPNs being illegal, sort of, technically, maybe not so much. I've been seeing, seeing all sorts of wonky stories about that. But that's just the nature of trying to end it itself. You know, I just, I just told so much glee that the price is going, you know, going down uh, because people can buy. About praising about the whole holding instead of taking it back and going, okay, what can we do to help stem or ease people's um, fears, if you will? Because that's what FUD is, fear and uncertainty. And I, mean, I don't know what the D is. Anyways, it's a little hot, I'm walking. A lot of breath here. Had to get these escape dogs I had a couple hours ago. And these two little dogs, they dug themselves out like little pros, little Steve McQueens, if you will. Got out of the fence, under the fence, started running around the neighborhood. Ended up chasing them around for 45 minutes. Ran probably like a good two, two and a half miles, making sure they don't get. Uh, hit by cars or uh, in people's yards or ever do other dogs messing with them and spent probably like a good almost three maybe four mile ex excapade getting these dogs some little beat thought I rested enough for this walk but guess not but I just it just bothered me the glee really it just bothered me the glee from the posts I've been seeing the YouTube commentators out there, podcast, um, all the different social media, the, the glee that people had that they were able to scoop this up and not thinking about what exactly they were scooping up, what that meant for other people, whether it be you know, on the West where they were a noob and they just got scared or they're in China and their fear is a legitimate fear. They, the, the uncertainty is legitimate. They don't know what their position is to be and they're hedging their bets in the sense, I want to live. Now, it may turn out that that fear is wrong, that uncertainty is wrong, but it's not coming out of some mythical place or some, I don't know what the word, this uh, <sighs> exaggeration, if you will. It's, it's a reality. It's, it's happened enough in the country. It's been paraded enough around the state media. It's known enough that certain actions get you in prison. Certain actions get you done with, basically. And nobody wants that in life. And so, it's just, it's just a bit of a mess. I hope that these exchanges do come back online. That China just wanted to regulate and this is their way of regulating. That things get back to square that the, the Chinese traders or Bitcoiners that may have sold were able to buy, obviously, a bit more than they, they dropped at, but are able to get back into the community, back at work, back doing what they need to do. So that's it. Thank you for listening. Again, 
R.I.P. Kim Bozik. This is my little ode to you and uh, to the moon.